Welcome to the Chinese Canadian Museum's podcast, The School Room. I'm your host, Melissa Lee, CEO of the museum. Thank you for joining us. International Women's Day is this month on March 8th. It's a global holiday celebrating the social, economic, cultural, and political achievements of women. On this episode, we are thrilled to welcome Arlene Chan, a Chinese-Canadian woman who has fought tirelessly for our community. Arlene is a writer, historian, and activist who has been awarded the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond and Platinum Jubilee Awards, Tri-Delta Women of Achievement Award, and the Chinese-Canadian Legend Award. She is also the president of the Jean Lum Foundation and serves as an advisor and consultant for Chinese diaspora culture, for many institutions, including 2022 Disney Pixar movie, Turning Red. That's a particular favorite of my children's. Welcome, Arlene, to our show. Thank you. I'm so thrilled to be asked to be interviewed. Thank you. We're so glad to have you. So let's get right into it. While we were doing research on a lot of your work and practice, we noticed that a lot of what you do has been documenting the history, culture, and lived experiences of the Chinese Canadian community, particularly in your hometown of Toronto. Can you tell us how you got into doing this work and whether your professional career as a librarian uh, influenced that? Okay, it's all intertwined together. Um, my interest started when I was very young, um, preteen, teen years, and being an avid reader, um, and which which led into my uh, future life as a librarian. Um, I would would go to the library looking for material and about history of Chinese people, anything about Chinese people, especially in Canada, any heroes or pioneers. There was practically nothing there and so this was something that really struck me and so I was always collecting little bits and pieces of newspaper clippings and magazine articles because there was just so little and um, so my interest goes way back to when I was younger and I really didn't start writing about the history of the Chinese in Canada and in Toronto particularly until um, way into my adult years um, because when I was working full-time as a librarian and raising my my two boys looking after the household it was uh, there wasn't very much time um, so I just kind of fell into writing accidentally a publisher had approached someone to write a children's book about my mother Jean Lum um, who was the first Chinese Canadian woman to receive the Order of Canada for her community work and at the time that the publisher spoke to my mother and said, oh, my, no, Arlene, she's too busy. She's raising a family. She's working full time. And so when I, she told me this, I just sort of said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm, I'm very interested in doing this. And I, so I said to the publisher, you know, what, what I can do is write one chapter for this children's book about my mom. And if you like it, I'll carry on. And if you don't, I totally understand. And that's how I accidentally got into writing and even though I was still working um, I made time to do this and even though I'd heard my stories stories from my mom so many times over the years um, I really had to interview her and really get the details and um, I was so thrilled that I wrote this book it got published it got recognized at the Children's Book Center as being a, a selected book and so this was so important to me because our stories were not being told. And so having my mother's story told, because um, for her being in Toronto, being a woman, being of Chinese heritage, it was so important that people learn her story. And I wanted to instill a sense of pride for children and um, young people who are going to the library, finding books to find a story like that for about a young, girl who was so young who had so little when she was growing up and yet was able to accomplish so much so that's what kind of launched my my writing career and then that has launched a lot of things about speaking engagements and and continuing my writing what is so meaningful is that you were able to have that connection to your mother by being able to write that book directly i think the other thing that struck me also was how the publisher you know, just assumed, oh, because you're a mother and have children, you're too busy. 
to take on this extra professional commitment. And I think that's particularly pertinent for International Women's Day, where sometimes a lot of these assumptions are made about what women can accomplish and what women can do. And it's a lot more juggling than people would think. Well, and don't forget, we're talking about, you know, a long, you know, several decades ago, too, things have changed. I mean, things are definitely moving forward. And it's kind of like little inch by inch. And then we have a giant leap backwards. And then we have to start going inch by inch again. But when I when I started writing, there were just only a handful of writers at that time. And one person I so admire and respect is Paul Yee. So he's one of the few early voices. And so things are really moving along that more and more, you know, fewer assumptions are being made about what we can, what we can't do. But I think it's so important that we do have a voice, not only in writing, but in the media and social media. This is so different from the time when I grew up and especially so different from the time when my mother grew up because, you know, she was born in Nanaimo and and spent some years in Vancouver before she moved to Toronto as a 16 year old. She lived during the worst times in terms of especially growing up in British Columbia as a young girl. She had to quit school when she was 12 years old to help support the family during the depression. But that was a time when there were over 100 anti-Chinese policies and laws in place. And so when I think of how the environment, the times that my mother grew up and then what she was able to achieve, but it always had an impact on her life because she well, always had this feeling because she went to a segregated school when, in Nanaimo for indigenous and Chinese and Japanese children. And she always wondered, why am I outside the circle? Why am I being treated so differently? So this whole um, idea of how do we get Canadian, Chinese Canadians be included in Canadian life. So this is something that my mother fought for. This was something that I was hoping to do with my own writing, that people hear our stories because by sharing stories, by people knowing our history. Um, for example, um, I always get a, a kick out of people when they say to me, where are you from? And I say, you know, from Toronto, I was born here. I said, no, where are you really from? Or I get the, the, the comment, you speak such good English. And I'm always so proud to tell them that my grandfather, my mother's father, he came to Canada in 1899. And when I tell them that, they're kind of like, it's such a shock for them that, you know, the Chinese have been here for that long and just even my own relatives. So I think this the whole story of we're part of Canadian life and why do we have to keep pushing this? Because it's something that I don't know, we have to educate people. And that's why I'm so happy that I get a chance to talk to you. I get to tell stories. I get to go to many, I've spoken to thousands of school children, people and telling them about our history to tell them that, you know, Canada is a land of immigrants. We all come here from some place or another at one point in time to join the indigenous peoples who were here thousands of years before we even started arriving here. And so we're all really newcomers here, but we all belong in Canada. And this is something that I really feel that my storytelling, what my mother accomplished, what so many of the early Chinese Canadians have accomplished to move us further and further so that we are more included in Canadian life. And that, you know, I'll, I hope we get to a point where we don't have to fight for something like this, that is just, we are part of Canadian life. So let's talk a little bit more about your mother. Uh, so for those of our listeners who don't know, your mother is the very famous Jean Lum. She was the first Chinese Canadian woman and first restaurateur inducted into the Order of Canada. And we actually have her Chinese immigration certificate in our feature exhibition, The Paper Trail to the 1923 Chinese Exclusion Act. I mean, I knew she was the first Chinese Canadian woman, but I didn't know she was the first restaurateur inducted to the Order of Canada. Can you tell us a little bit more? You spoke a little about how she had to leave school when she was 12 to work in the restaurant. Can you tell us a little more about that life, those stories? Yes. So my mother um, quit, had to quit school when she was 12 and eventually had to move to Toronto from British Columbia to work again to help support the family. 
And I have to tell you that when my grandfather arrived in 1899, at the time the head tax was $50, and he was one of the few Chinese men who was able to bring over his wife, my grandmother. By the time she came over a few years later, the head tax was $100. That being said, my my grandparents had 12 children in their family. And so my mother grew up in this large, warm, loving family with, you know, 12, 12 siblings altogether. So when she came to Toronto as a 16 year old, the, the population in Toronto was very small. Our Chinatown was a confined in a, a neighborhood that was regarded as the ward, which was regarded as one of the poor areas of the city, close to the train station right downtown. And so when she arrived here, there were only about a dozen Chinese families here. Again, and the ratio of men to women was 18 to one. So this really had such an impact on her in terms of especially for her coming from this large family and then coming here and finding only about 12 a dozen or so families here in Chinatown here. And so this was really something that informed her community work, her again, her desire for the Chinese people to be more included. Like, what, what can I do to help this bachelor society, you know, as we call the bachelor society, even though most of the men who were living here were married, but their wives are back in China because of the Exclusion Act and then before that, the head taxes. And I was at a, a family association banquet last week and I was speaking to the group there. And so I pointed out to two tables of 10. I said, there are 10 people at this table, 10 people at this table. So just imagine in those times, there would be 20 people sitting here, but there would only be um, one or two women in that whole group. Because it, again, the, the, the male female ratio was, was very severe. So when my mother arrived here, she worked in a, a restaurant. Um, at the beginning. And then within a year or two, she branched out. She borrowed $200 and opened up a grocery store. And she worked within a year or so, earned enough money to start bringing over her, her parents, my grandparents, and her siblings. So all the family came to Toronto from Vancouver, with the exception of one uncle who remained back in Nanaimo because he um, had a farm there. So my mother eventually got married with, through a matchmaker, through, uh, met my father, through a matchmaker and they ran a, a grocery store. And then eventually they um, opened a restaurant in Toronto's Chinatown here. And so Chinese food, this was again after the war, after World War II. And as you know, so many things changed for the, the Chinese community in terms of the repeal of the Exclusion Act, the Chinese got the right to vote, the Chinese could now run for politics, run for public office, but still the Chinese Having a voice, that was still largely absent, even with the vote, even with people starting to get elected, like our, like your Douglas Jung from Vancouver, who was the first Chinese Canadian politician to be elected in 1957. But the still, it was so important for people to learn about the Chinese community and how was that mainly at the beginning was through Chinese food, through Chinese culture. And my parents had their, their restaurant, the Kuang Chao restaurant in Toronto's Chinatown. I wanted to ask, do you know why it was called Kuang Chao? Yes, Kuang Chao was the name of the capital city of Guangdong province. So it was called Kuang Chao. And Kuang Chao, the capital of Guangdong was famous for its food. So if you wanted good food, you went to Kuang Chao, which is um, the, the name in Cantonese. Um, so it's Kuang Chu right now in, in Mandarin. So they named it Kuang Chao Restaurant, and it was one of the restaurants in Toronto's Chinatown that really popularized Chinese Canadian food. Um, I mean, people make fun of Chinese Canadian food now, even though it's still very popular, but people make fun of it because chop suey, you know, sweet and sour chicken balls, egg rolls, those kinds of dishes. But Chinese food was a really important way to introduce people to Chinese culture. And my parents' restaurant, the Kuang Chao, and several other main ones that opened up after World War II, they turned Chinatown from a place to avoid to a destination. And there were lineups going into the into my parents' restaurant. What were the most popular dishes that you can remember? The, the most popular dishes, of course, were like chop suey, um, sweet and sour chicken balls, of course, fortune cookies, which as you know, are not really Chinese, but still serve to this day at Chinese restaurants. So those kinds of really, but then I have to say too that the Kuang Chao was one of the first uh, restaurants in Chinatown 
um, to serve dim sum. So, I mean, we're going way back to the 60s. Um, so what was the importance of this Chinese food, not only introducing Torontonians to Chinese culture, but it became really popular with politicians, with the media. A lot of famous people went to my parents' restaurant. And so this really helped to heighten uh, awareness of Chinese culture. So this was something that my parents did um, together, serving Chinese food. And my mother ended up doing cooking shows and being on radio to talk about food. But she also did something else which, in terms of Chinese culture as a way of how do I become more included in Canadian life is she started up a Chinese dance group, which was very revolutionary in those early years. So this was going again back to the 60s. And um, the dance group, the Chinese community dancers of Ontario were so popular that travel, the troupe traveled across Canada and most significantly um, auditioned to, to do a command performance for the Queen for Canada's centennial in 1967. So the Chinese community dancers performed um, on Parliament Hill on for the July 1st celebrations. I know that when the, the dance troupe performed across Canada, including Vancouver, Winnipeg, like right across Canada, that for the first time, many, many people in the audience saw Chinese dance. They'd never seen it before. So my mother, she really wanted to, like, how do we introduce Chinese culture to the larger community? So this was through food and through dance. That's how my mother did it. Can you tell us a little more about Toronto Chinatown? Because a lot of your work and even your mother's work is embedded in the old Chinatown of Toronto, which from my understanding now, the Chinese communities in Toronto are all a little bit more dispersed. Yeah, our first Chinatown uh, was established and this was when my mother arrived. That was our first Chinatown. It developed very, very slowly in Toronto. And then after the Second World War, uh, what happened was because our first Chinatown was located in one of the poorest parts of the city before the war, but became very valuable real estate. But what happened was um, the city expropriated two thirds of our first Chinatown to build our new city hall in a, in a public square. Can you tell us what streets those are in Toronto? Just yeah, for the that viewers be, that might know. Yeah, yeah, Dundas and Elizabeth Street. So that was where our first Chinatown was. And so the Chinese community was forced to move along westward along Dundas Street to our second Chinatown, which developed um, starting in the 60s onwards um, at Spadina Avenue and Dundas. So that's our second Chinatown, which is now our largest Chinatown in Toronto. And eventually we had a third Chinatown which developed further east at Broadview and Girard. Um, so that was our, our third Chinatown. And now, of course, with the huge population of Chinese that we have living in Toronto here in the greater Toronto area, we have um, even larger communities in Markham and Richmond Hill and, and out in Scarborough. So, and people call the, the settlements there Chinatowns, but I don't re really regard those as Chinatowns and more like enclaves of, of Chinese businesses and residences. So I look at that we have three Chinatowns in this in this downtown in the city of Toronto. That's really interesting to see the differentiation between the enclaves of Chinese Canadian suburban communities in the greater Toronto area and Chinatowns specifically, which I think the distinction to you is it more Chinatowns are more about the restaurants, the shops, the services? No, because out in the suburbs, or not suburbs, but out in Markham or Richmond Hill, lots of restaurants, um, businesses, uh, professional services. But what I look at Chinatown as being a more traditional uh, definition that it's an inner city, that it has um, the vehicle traffic going through sidewalks, it's outdoors and people are walking around. Whereas when you go out to... Like we have our Pacific Mall, which is one of the largest um, Asian themed malls in North America. And I know you have very similar um, malls in Richmond. Um, you have yes. Aberdeen. So it's very similar to that. So I don't call those Chinatowns. Those are, you know, it's a community that's centered around like a shopping mall. So it, it, it's very, very different. But uh, 
we have such a huge population of uh, Chinese living here, over half a million. And um, I know that all the Chinese who were living downtown, it was a sign that you've made it if you could move out of downtown and move out into the suburbs where you could have a car, like two car garage and you could have a big home, lots of property compared to being downtown and it's very crowded and you're parking on the street. And there's quite a division now because our community is so large that you have the downtown Chinese community and then you have the, the community that's living out in Markham and Richmond Hill and, and north of the, the city of Toronto proper. So it's interesting when you organize events in the in Chinese community events, you have to be mindful of who, which audience are you appealing to? It's just our, our community here is so large, which is fantastic. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Pixar movie Turning Red? Mm -hmm. Just because, you know, I've watched that film a number of times with my girls who love it and identify with the main character who's a girl in uh, the film, but it also takes place in Toronto. And would you consider that really a urban story of a Chinese Canadian family in Toronto or more suburban? It feels a little bit in between. And what was your experience consulting for it? That was a really exciting um, experience. Um, I was hired as a cultural consultant uh, because of my background you know, about our Chinatown uh, here in Toronto. And I I really loved the story and I really liked it that, you know, it, it it's about being Chinese Canadian in a, a major city in Toronto. And it really did feature a lot of the landmarks that are that when you look at it, you say, oh, that's Toronto, that's the CN Tower, that's Chinatown. And of course, our Chinatown was, it was glorified somewhat to make it very colorful. You know, it doesn't really look like that, but there is enough there to say, oh, yes, that's Toronto's Chinatown. And um, I think what was really significant was that that I was consulting and there were there was a large group of the consultants who worked. We, we, I didn't actually go to Los Angeles, unfortunately. This was all during pandemic. Um, everything was done by Zoom, but every time we had a Zoom call, there were you know sometimes 20 odd people that were all uh, meeting at the same time and we were asked to look at certain images. So really got involved at the very beginning stages. You know, is this the right color to use? Uh, with, like for example, they had two guardian lions um, that were in the temple. So when they showed me the picture, I said, well, you don't have those inside as people are leaving. You have them at the entrance as people are coming into the temple. And then, you know, just the altar table, um, what they, the color of the candles. So, you know, that kind of detail they were asking. So that was so significant because I think um, what happens even in even more recent films and TV shows that are have been that involve Chinese Canadian or American uh, Chinese um, actors that there's still I understand that there's still a lack of learning about what is correct culturally correct so for turning red they were really um, really wanted to have it right and so the, you know even the the dress of the the, the ancestral uh, woman, they were really concerned about, is this the right period um, for this kind of dress and things like that. So I, I really respected that they were interested in that kind of detail. And I know that even when I was being asked certain questions that I didn't have a lot of knowledge about, and I referred them to somebody else who would know something more about that, and they called that person in to, to help with um, advising on religious ceremonies and things like that. So. I think that element of authenticity where one consults cultural experts from that culture, it really creates a new kind of understanding of the film and makes those of us that are Chinese Canadians feel like the film is really great and really familiar to our own childhood and culture um, and great for younger kids too, to learn about our culture in that way. Yeah. Um, I have a question I know you run Toronto Chinatown walking tours in your spare time, and we have a lot of those here in Vancouver, but I've never been on one in Toronto. I look forward to going on one next time I come and visit. What are some of the must-see or must-eat stops on your tour? 
Uh, with, I do tours of both our first Chinatown and also our second Chinatown, Spadine and Dundas. And sometimes I even do both at the same time. I start at the old one and end up in, just depends what the age group is as well, because there's you know quite a lot of walking. But I really um, show, this is what we had here before, and it's just showing the layers of immigration um, because we've not ever had our own Chinatown when we were the first uh, immigrant group to be in that location. Uh, so for example, in our first Chinatown, there were many, many groups. The Chinese were the last major immigrant group to settle into the, the Chinatown area. But I like to point out this used to be a synagogue or this used to be a restaurant, like a Jewish restaurant. Toronto is so multicultural, so diverse, and we have so many layers of history. And to show the evolution of a neighborhood and it's constantly changing. So that's when I when I go on my tour, I like to point out all the different things, places. When I stop at one place, I usually talk about two or three places that were here before. It was first a house and then it became a Methodist church, and then it became a, a theater, and then it became a burlesque house, and then it was used for Chinese uh, movies and entertainment on Sundays when Toronto the Good, everything was closed down on Sundays. And so the Chinese community would rent it on Sunday for their Chinese performances and Cantonese opera performances. So that kind of story, and it really resonates with people because they said, oh, my grand, like, you know, Jewish person would say, oh, my grandmother remembers coming here when it was the, the Strand Theater and things like that. So I think it tells the story that even though we are as, as Chinese, um, one of the newer immigrant groups here, there's so much more for us to share. We're not that different because we have more common stories than people realize. And so when I do my tours, I like to tie in all the different histories and all the different um, peoples who have lived in that spot when I stop there. And I really like to show how the Chinese community has changed over the years, how it was first, if you went into Chinatown, the language that was being spoken was Toi San Hua, Taishanese. And then as Hong Kong became the largest source of immigrants coming into Canada, then Cantonese became the language in Chinatown. And then of course, China at one point was the largest source of immigrants coming into Canada. And Mandarin um, is now, it was like slowly Mandarin came up to here and now Mandarin has um, overpassed Cantonese as the most spoken uh, Chinese language in Toronto here. So again, I like to point out, it's not only the language, but it's just culturally too, in terms of food, in terms of the services that are being offered here, that really reflect the different Chinese groups that have come into Toronto. And it just shows not only is City of Toronto really diverse, not only is um, Canada diverse, but our Chinatown is very diverse because we've had so many different waves of immigrants coming in and adding their their touch to our Chinatown here. And I include like Vietnamese Chinese because in the 70s after the war ended in Vietnam, we had uh, hundreds of uh, Vietnamese refugees that came to Toronto and settled here. And many of those were, were um, ethnic Chinese people. So that's why we have so many, you know, Vietnamese restaurants and businesses in our Chinatown here. So ultimately in a way what you're doing is you are showing that the Chinatowns, really Chinese Canadians, weave into the history of Canadian identity by all these communities living together um, during these historical years that just happen to be in Chinatown. Yes. Thank you so much for coming on our podcast, Arlene. For anyone interested in learning more about the Chinese Exclusion Act and the stories of those who lived it, like Arlene's mother, Jean Lum, visit our feature exhibition at the Chinese Canadian Museum in Vancouver, Chinatown, The Paper Trail to the 1923 Chinese Exclusion Act. Thanks so much, Arlene, for joining us. Thank you. This podcast was recorded on the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. We invite you all to reflect on the territories that you're on and the host nations. To learn more about the Chinese Canadian Museum and book tickets, visit us at ChineseCanadianMuseum.ca and follow us on Instagram at CCMuseumBC for updates. The School Room is presented by the Chinese Canadian Museum, hosted by Dr. Melissa Carmen Lee, produced by Rosalie Gonawan, 
and advised by Sarah Ling and Catherine Clement. Production is supported by Noah Taylor and the Walrus Lab. The theme music and original audio was created by Joshua Young, and graphic design is by Studio Pian Pian He and Max Harvey. Stay tuned for next month's episode of The Schoolroom, available wherever you get your podcasts.